it, it is surprising how much the British knew about what Indians were doing at that point in time. There was something seriously wrong about the post-Indian Indian independence period, this tussle between Nehru and Patel that we see elsewhere as well, right? That really reflects even in the intelligence. While Patel knew what was the value for, of secret intelligence, Nehru was completely against it. Uh, the moment he came back to India, he, there was a disaster awaiting him. When he visited Washington, the, the ambassador of India there was Nehru's sister, Mrs. Vijayalakshmi Pandit. And because he had failed to call on her, she created a huge hue and cry about it. And Sanjeevi was shown the door and the report was thrashed. So 1949, a first attempt was actually made to give India an external intelligence agency by the initiative of the intelligence leader himself, not the political leader, but the intelligence leader. And that was thrashed. The top leadership were all officers who were experts of uh, uh, communism, international communism. They were avowedly anti-communist. They hated the communists. So they saw China through the prism of international communism and they said that this is going to be a threat to us. Now because Nehru who did not see and Krishnamanan did not see the world in this way, they really did not buy that argument. A very good evening. Welcome back to Swarajya. You are watching Swarajya Conversations with Sharan Sethi. I am very privileged to be introducing Dr. Dheeraj Parmesha Chaya to you. Dr. Chaya is uh, an expert on intelligence studies. He has his PhD in intelligence studies from the University of Leicester and he's come out with his latest book titled India's Intelligence Culture and Strategic Surprises Spying for the South Block. Dr. Chaya, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, very good to have you here on Swarajya, sir. Thank you, Sharan. It's, it's my pleasure to be here uh, with Swarajya. And since we're going to be discussing our book, let me just show you all the book once. Uh, yeah. And thank you so much. We'll be putting the link in the description below for anybody who wants to buy the book. The link will be there. It's uh, published by Rulech. And uh, if you want to get an insight into what exactly Dr. Chaya works on, you must read all of his articles. And we'll put the link to his articles below as well. And it's really interesting. He writes on India's strategic culture as far as espionage, intelligence is concerned. And this is right up my alley, which is why every time I chase him first to make sure that he gives us an exclusive conversation on any of the writings that he does. But uh, tell us what this book is about, because uh, we will go through the table of contents of the book as well, and we'll continue in a way in which it is chapterized. But from what I can see, you're starting from way back. Uh, from when India's original intelligence culture was envisioned and developed from the times of Kautilya in the Mauryan Empire to the post-independent India. So give us the idea of this book. Okay, um, thank you for that, Sharon. Uh, before I dive into the contents and talk about what exactly is there in the book, let me first at the outset talk about who this book is addressed to. Right? So it, it is written keeping and bearing in mind two particular sets of audience. First is that of scholars of intelligence itself, right? Because intelligence studies, when you look at it as a subject, right, it evolved in the West sometime during the 1980s. I mean, there were some scholars who were writing about intelligence even before that. Uh, but with all seriousness, it started during the 1980s when they realized that, you know, when you look at diplomatic history or when you write, look at the history of the Cold War itself, what kept the Cold War cold, right? What, what ensured that the, that the Soviet Union and the United States don't get to war with each other, right? That's when they realized that the key role played by signals intelligence was, some, was somewhat missing from uh, the diplomatic and, you know, uh, the history of the Cold War itself. So then thanks to the opening up of certain archives uh, in the West, they realized that now is the time that they can write uh, the history of the Cold War from the point of view of intelligence. Uh, but besides history, there was also another reason why uh, scholars started to study intelligence. That is, they wanted to avoid surprise attacks or they wanted to avoid being surprised. So here what happened was... Um, there was, it was taken for granted previously that, you know, there is an intelligence failure and that is why you're caught off guard and or you're surprised. Uh, but eventually they realized uh, that, you know, there they, they came a conflict between two really, two groups of uh, scholars. One was known as the Orthodox School of Thought and the second was known as the Revisionist School of Thought. What the Orthodox School of Thought said that, you look, you, you can have any number, any number of intelligence indicators or warning indicators, but surprise is inevitable. Right? But the revisionists argued, argued that no, surprise is not inevitable because if you have good intelligence, you can always avoid being surprised. So the, the, this was the kind of argument that was happening between the two of them. But then there was a problem. They had only been looking at Western cases, firstly, point number one. 
second they had only been looking at cases of intelligence failure right so what happens is when you conduct post mortems of a failed uh, episode you might come and come under certain impressions you might draw certain conclusions about why you failed but there is no real way of testing your arguments that is if you don't have a successful case then how would you know what you are prescribing in the event of this failure will actually work in in the event of a success correct so that was the biggest drawback that they hadn't really looked at a case of intelligent success now we in india despite having a classic case of intelligent success that is the 1971 war our scholars were still yet to look at india's contemporary security history from an intelligence point of view so when you talk of the 1962 war 71 war 99 right. war all the 65 war all these contemporary security history uh, that we talk of uh, modern india we had scholars talking about all of these events from the point of view of um, political history military history diplomatic history or military analysis and so on and so forth but intelligence was completely missing right so you have on the one end you have the western scholars who are limited in their analysis because they're looking only at western cases and intelligence failures alone on the other hand you have indian scholars indian security scholars who have completely neglected the uh, the role of foreign intelligence or strategic intelligence in averting surprise attacks so that's where i decided that one uh, our own community of intelligence study scholars need to know how intelligence is done in places outside the anglosphere and the and the uh, western world right. and secondly indians need to know i mean especially now you know that a couple of books have already come out uh, one by nitin gokhale on rn kao um, and yeah. vikram sood uh, mr vikram sood who is the former special uh, former secretary of rndw was also been kind enough to write a forward for my book he has also published two books now so they uh, and they've been quite successful right so we see that there is a growing interest among uh, indian readers on topics of intelligence so i thought that this is the right time that somebody has to write an authoritative history of india's foreign intelligence to the extent possible so i was fortunate enough to get access to archives in the united states in the united kingdom new delhi as well as i was also fortunate enough to have access to a lot of these um, gentlemen who have, who have served with such great dignity in the past and they were open to the idea of discussing their um, journeys with with an academic like me so for the for the indian reader this is important because it it gives you the history of india's india's foreign intelligence culture whereas for a student of intelligence it is important because it tells you in reality that it is not sufficient to look at intelligence organizations and operations per se but you need to go beyond and look at how the culture of that country's intelligence works okay only then so, so taking you back to those two schools of thought that are saying so when the revisionists say that intelligence can actually be fixed surprises can be avoided they are making certain recommendations that you know you fix this uh, flaw in the organization or you fix this flaw build build this kind of capability say linguistic capability or anything of that sort they say that if you have this kind of capabilities you can overcome uh, being surprised right they talk of methodological professionalism and so on and so forth but my argument is that until unless you don't understand the culture of this place you would only be aping some of the reforms that the west have done and probably find very different results here so what i aim to do here is show clearly what india's intelligence culture has looked like in the 20th century right. so that we know what reforms work and what reforms don't work but then since you were uh, telling us about how most of the studies on intelligence is based on the failures of the past how do you get access in a place like india especially about its successes how did you go about that Oh yes yeah. so a lot of lot of the details about the 1971 war is actually there in the open domain when i say open domain of course not for not for the public but then the records are kept in the nehru memorial museum and library um, under the pn huxa papers uh, series so there is quite a bit there uh, and also some the the archive the british archives gave me a lot of information a lot of i mean in fact it it is surprising how much the british knew about what indians were doing at that point in time and uh, it is not that we failed in terms of covering up our information but uh there there's there's also another side to the story we deliberately wanted the british to know some of what we are doing uh, some of the covert action plans and all that so and and also in the united states so there's a beautiful book written by gary bass uh, on it's called the blood telegraph so multiple sources coming from the united states india and the uk and beyond all of it like i said uh, i was fortunate enough to have access to officers who had served at that point in time who could give me a lot of valuable information about how the organization evolved and so on and so forth so combining all this kind of data i realized that yes when you say intelligence success right our perception of intelligence success in 1971 war is simply that uh, pakistan launched operation chengiz khan just on on, on december 3rd and we were aware of it now this is a fact that was brought to our notice by uh, la- the late b raman when he wrote his book uh, called the cowboys of raw 
but going beyond that there are a lot more other successes right if you, if if we have time to talk about the entire war in its entirety uh, i could tell you that you know since december of april of 1969 that is almost for two and a half years before the war happened since then the rndw was seriously tracking all the developments that were happening in east pakistan and uh, the there were three key players during that during that point in time one was mr arun kaw himself who was uh, the chief of the rndw and his deputy mr shankaran nayar and then the, there was another person uh, you know, another officer who was, who was of the joint of the rank of joint director his name was um, p n banerjee he was the head of the calcutta station so these three uh, men actually knew bangladesh or east pakistan then better than even the east pakistanis so they had made a forecast in april 1969 itself that this is going to be an uh, the independence of bangladesh it is going to be in uh, be an eventuality and we have to prepare accordingly so uh, it's just not that we operationally predicted the pakistani air strikes but with pinpoint precision we could also point out the political events that are going to transpire in the future and that exactly was the strength of the agency at that point in time really interesting so, yeah, so and uh, we'll, we'll sorry, get to sorry, that sorry. yeah sorry to cut you off but as far as information is concerned like i said it was it was uh, it was a triangulation of data from archival sources from secondary sources as well as that of interviews conducted uh, with some of the officers who have to date to this date not spoken a word about all of these but then they felt that the time was right uh, for them to open up to an academic and uh, give their side of the story you must be very lucky to access all of that information we'll come to that and we'll discuss those wars and how intelligence worked um, in a post colonial independent india but do give us a little context of how intelligence and intelligence op- operations worked in a kautilya state because you've also written about that in the beginning parts of your book okay uh, thank you for that question as well um, instead of directly delving into what the kautilya intelligence looked like i'll tell you why why i actually wrote that chapter so the chapter forms the part of an uh, part of an entire part which is a three a three chapter part which talks about the kautilya intelligence culture then it speaks about the colonial intelligence culture and the birth of post independence indian intelligence culture now what has happened is whenever you you, uh, you know whenever you have somebody write about say the chinese intelligence or chinese way of warfare you'll definitely see them talk about sun tzu whenever you have an indian talk about india's art of warfare or whatever you will definitely see them talk about kautilya right yeah it's it's sort of become rhetorical with no real understanding of Uh, whether there is any reflection to the past or whether do we really draw some inspiration from the past in, and if so in what manner that these are questions that are not germane to many of the, many of the scholars they just take it for granted that we can make these grand cultural arguments but i didn't want to do that i really wanted to see uh, what, what how things are moving because when you talk about indian india's intelligence culture it is easy to say that we draw a lot of our inheritance from the kautilyan time and this is because many people don't have an understanding of how to read the text of the shastra they tend to directly read it for what it is i mean the written word and that is a many people consider it to be a counter counter intelligence state which is what uh, which is china or russia and other countries today where everybody is spying on everybody else no that's completely wrong right that's because when you look at the ancient indian culture the driving principles were not ideologies like marxism communism xyz and all that right ours was purely rajadharma right where the citizens of the state or the subjects however you like to call them the idea was to make sure that they are able to enjoy the fruits of their of their hard work and to that end the state had to ensure that there is security right so even the, so in such a context when intelligence is conducted it is not just spying on each other that is just one part right the espionage part is come is covered very well most most scholars tend to talk about it very well but when you look at it at the core right because rajadharma was what was driving india's state craft we see that there is a certain knowledge culture right and it is that knowledge culture then translates into policy so when you see kautilya's advice to the king he says that the king has to have the ability to learn listen grasp retain understand thoroughly and then reflect on that knowledge right now in the kautilya right. state what happens is he is not talking about state like the modern day he is talking about the king right so we will have to interchange king with today state so when he says that today state has to have the ability to learn listen what is exact so when you put that in the intelligence context right he is exactly talking about intelligence collection right the state must have the ability to listen to whatever is happening in the world to to scan the horizon right to learn about what is happening in the world to be abreast with all the developments that is happening in the world but the next thing that he says is you need to have the ability to grasp and retain knowledge this is what we term as institutional memory 
which means that the stay modern state has to have institutions which can retain this kind of memory right you look at what happened in the united states uh, when 911 uh, attacks happened right there was nobody there who knew arabic because they're completely focused on russia the entire uh, right. american intelligence bureaucracy was focused on soviet union so suddenly there was a yeah. new uh, threat and they did, they did not know what to do but because they are the united states they have so much of wealth and you know they they have so many resources so much of resources they could raise libraries they could raise scholars on arabic studies as quickly as no other country could pro- probably do it but here this is the, uh, we have a serious problem right we say china is a threat and pakistan is a threat and all that but then the way our bureaucracies are shaped right we don't have that ability to retain that knowledge institutional memory is not there especially when if i got into the nitty gritties of how the rnw works and all that where you have deputation is coming from one uh, agency to another and all that there's no real incentive for that individual to get himself acquainted with the organizational history to learn to you know look at the past operation and ask himself what lessons have been learned and so on and so forth so these are two key components but the third component what cortelia was talking about is reflecting on that knowledge that is what in intelligence we call as the speculative aspect that is you are knowledgeable knowledgeable about something you got some present data you you gathered information about something with that you need to have the ability to forecast what could happen right the forecasting can never be 100% correct right but it has to come from a space of knowledge if there are knowledge yeah. gaps then you can't do anything about it there can be informational gaps because the enemy is trying to cover up his information he is not trying to get, he is trying to protect his own information so you don't have that kind of information understandable but if there are serious knowledge gaps that is what happened in 1962 right you operated on a false belief that china was your friend right the fact that the chinese are going to attack on so and so date that could have been that if you did not know that that's fine pardonable but this erroneous assumption that china and you uh, india will lead will the world uh, as asian yeah. uh, powers and so on that shows a clear sense of knowledge gap and the reason is not entirely the uh, intelligence failure there we'll come to that when we talk about the 1962 war but going back to the cautelian state that's what the cautelian state said that there has to be knowledge power for policy formulation and on top of it intelligence also has to the, it has to have the covert action capability right the only yeah. one place where cautelia falls short not because of his i mean i'm not I'm, i don't think i have the right ability to comment on cautelia's intellect but all i'm saying is because he lived in an india which was predominantly hindu right he did not see differences in cultures right for example he did, right. uh, at that day he did not you did not have pakistan and islamic pakistan which behaved differently it's a pre islamic concept of exactly yeah. so he took for, he took it for granted that the entire subcontinent had one uniform uniform culture so we did not have we do not really need to worry about culture as a component in intelligence but today when we have different uh, uh, you know two different kinds of states on on india's borders i think culture becomes a very important topic so that's one small thing that i think is missed out of uh, the artha shastra when one reads it but otherwise it has a lot to offer about the role intelligence has to play especially strategic intelligence has to play in uh, in in foreign policy making or strategic military policy making now this is what our state right. looked like our our civilization state looked like this is the kind of knowledge we have now yes it is true because of what about oral cultures or limited stories we've heard from our uh, parents and grandparents and so on there is a tendency for us to retain some of it in our dna but lived experiences really affect us a lot and that is why i say that the, the period of colonialism is extremely important because what happened during colonialism is what actually affected uh, independent india for one thing colonial britain uh, when when the uh, when the uh, you know the company came the john company or uh, the, the uh, east india company came they were pretty different they came for the purposes of uh, business so they looked at india very differently they cooperated with indians very differently the first yeah. actual problem that they had was that of uh, the 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 thugs you know which you know as the uh, today when you go to shimla there's something known yeah. as the thuggy department which we uh, which was formed in 1929 and 1930 so for you see that they did not have any real need for intelligence first of all the reason is because you know when you go back to that time the victorian uh, england's time England always did things in comparison to what the Russians did. Okay, it's 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 like this, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter how bad I am; I'm better than somebody else. That is the kind of attitude. So the British did not want to do anything the Russians did because they demonized everything the Russians did. So the Russians had a certain kind of secret police. So the British said, "We don't want, we don't want something like that." So there was a strong aversion to secret intelligence. All right. and this gradually changes you will see because i mean as a uh, the, the way i'm say putting uh, putting across all this one might get an idea that i'm defending the british no certainly not they have done horrible things to india <laughs> but the point is that it was not an easy work for all those guys who wanted to do horrible things to india as well because 
there, there's always this division of power, one between London and India and also within India between um, the Viceroy and the provincial governors. So you see throughout the colonial period, it's, it's a quite a lengthy chapter that I've written, you see that there are certain individuals who are saying that we want intelligence agencies. Right? We want intelligence agencies. Firstly, they saw a threat of revolutionary terrorism. I shouldn't be using the word as an Indian because for us, they're not terrorists. But from the British colonial state's point of view, they were clearly terrorists. So they had the, the threat of it. Uh, and then they had the First World War where communism became a threat after that. And then Second World War was, was, was the first major threat that they saw. And, um, uh, and before that, when the Great Game was happening, also the threat of the Soviet, uh, Soviets coming down and all that, the Russians coming down and all that. But the point is that here, when you see one, there is there is a deep seated aversion against secret intelligence and so on. So, but then there are individuals who are trying to drive it, which means that you know there is always a tussle between uh, the individuals who are for secret intelligence and individuals who are not for secret intelligence. Third thing is when it actually came, it gave birth to another kind of problem. It was always manned by a Britisher. There was once a proposal which said that at least the director of the Intelligence Bureau, which was formed in 1887, later Special Security Bureau, and then later on became uh, the Intelligence Bureau. There was a suggestion that the director of Intelligence Bureau should at least have one Hindu and a Muslim as, a, as his advisor. But London turned it down. He said, no, it's not happening. You have to know, the, you have to understand the pulse of the people yourself. Right. So it created a clear hierarchy between Indians and the, the British. Organizationally speaking, right, this actually impacted us once the British left. Because even today, when you look at uh, the our intelligence services, right, there is a very nasty discrimination between the IPS and the non-IPS, right. This is something that even retired IPS officers tell you, uh, right. So this is, I mean, when I was talking to Vikram, so they have written this in the book as well. He finally somehow he he compared this to the Indian caste hierarchy, you know. But once I studied the British period, I understood that this is not the Indian caste hierarchy, but it is the British discriminatory hierarchy that is set in. Where you believe that somebody's cleared UPSC, has become an IPS officer, can deal uh, things with things better, whereas the ones who actually become ACIO, DCIO, and all these, you know, uh, intelligence officers, they are of a right. lesser caliber. This is exactly what the British had done then. That you know, use the Indians for all this clerical work and all that, whereas the top topmost leadership, the managerial positions, were always handled by the Britishers. So this this trilogy of you know one being threat uh, threat react every time a threat comes you say that okay we need some sort of intelligence right now but then once the threat recedes you go back you 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 go back on your promise so you know you're building just bureaucracies so you see what happened in the Kautilian state it said that we are operating on a knowledge culture so this no in order to develop this knowledge culture you need to have good strategic intelligence whereas the colonial state is saying no we don't really believe in all this business we are here to just milk this cow as much as possible. Right. So as and when a threat emerges, we will work on it. But until then, there's no real reason for us to follow the, you know, pursue this path of working. Yeah. Now, when independence happens, or even before independence, when the interim government is formed in 1926, fortunately, yeah. you have a gentleman, Sardar Patel, who becomes the interior minister. He inherits all these uh, bureaucracies. I mean, he, he inherits the intelligence bureau. And he was somebody, uh, if you read some of, some of the biographies of uh, uh, Mr. Patel, you'll realize that Throughout the time he was struggling for freedom, or he was, even from the time he was a lawyer and all that, right? He was somebody who represented, he, he was on the criminal side of law. He was not on the other side of law, right? So he always knew the value of information. He always knew the value of um, uh, advanced analysis and so on. And he was an organizer. He was a very good organizer. So he knew the importance of intelligence. So the moment he, uh, right. he we got independence or there was talk of independence, and then he was made uh, the interior minister, he took the IB under his ropes and he made sure that he used the intelligence bureau for all sorts of monitoring purposes. Nobody was spared, right? Even members of the Congress, the Muslim League, the, the, and everybody else, they were, they, were, they were all targeted because he wanted to get information because he, he knew very well that he has a task ahead of him, right? right. And one thing that had always evaded the British, the, so under the Kautilian state, you see that intelligence was always centralized, right? Though there were decentralized powers to the analysts on the field and all that, it was generally centralized and the king had, king had managed much of the project. But in the colonial state, it is not like that. Like I, I, I already told you, right? It is always the individual is trying to drive it. Now, Patel had achieved that one thing that the British could never do it. He centralized intelligence in a manner that you could, one could never have thought about. But then there is something seriously wrong about the post-Indian Indian independence period. This tussle between Nehru and Patel that we see elsewhere as well, right? That really reflects even in the intelligence space. While Patel knew what was the value for, of secret intelligence, Nehru was completely against it. 
okay because nehru was that kind of a diplomatic guy kind of guy who had traveled across the world and he always was of the was of the opinion that the british colonial state was a secretive organization secretive uh, endeavor which we shouldn't emulate the whole gandhian thing that he talks about right and he says that the indian national congress was a transparent entity it was completely open right and that is something we need to follow uh, once india became independent as well so he was not really interested in this intelligence business he felt that diplomacy is the key to everything it is diplomacy is uh, the silver bullet to any problem i mean he didn't any such any problems at that point in time but even when a problem came he felt that um, um, he, he could always use diplomacy to solve the problems but the real problem came was internally you know there were communists wrecking havoc here and there there were communal violence and right. so on so forth right now this is an important period between 1947 to 1950 what happened is extremely crucial to understand india's foreign intelligence but this is a part okay. that's completely missed out of all sorts of analysis right so mm-hmm. what happens then is the moment we get independence um, and uh, the british intelligence uh, the, the british D- director of intelligence bureau is sent back home we have we need to look for an indian guy right so uh, what uh, patel does is he writes to the prime minister of madras province asking him to release a man called uh, rao bahadur sanjeevi okay tg sanjeevi right. and he requests sanjeevi to come and join him as the director of intelligence bureau right so this man comes and joins as the director of intelligence bureau the moment uh, you india gain, gets independence and partition happens a lot of our assets move over to pakistan okay because the previous dib what he does is he is a muslim all right so he takes away everything of value with him to pakistan so we are basically left with nothing okay right. single handedly sanjeevi and patel are trying to rebuild this organization trying to do a lot of things but because nehru is sort of disinterested in this the mandate that is given to him includes only internal domestic intelligence okay now fast forward to the year 1949 this becomes really important so 1949 what happens we realize in india that our intelligence bureau needs to learn this craft from across the world so there is a global tour sanctioned for sanjeevi right he he travels to bonn paris london washington name it he travels everywhere so around that point in time what happens is when he has to travel the mandate given to him is to study the local organizations uh, federal police and so on and so forth but when he reaches london there is another character there who is the indian high commissioner in london his name is kv krishna menon who goes on to become the defense minister later on right so krishna menon is extremely critical of uh, the ib's operations against the communists okay and he's also very uh, harsh about uh, the ib's relationship with uh, britain and especially the fact that anti communism is what uh, is what uh, what is guiding this uh, relationship so uh, what sanjeev does immediately is he writes a drafts a letter and and sends it back to india now this letter causes a lot of uh, ruckus here in new delhi though nehru ends up defending men and telling that you know it's is uh, hill mental health and all that but it causes a lot of problem from there what what sanjeevi does is he flies to washington now here is a very critical aspect that happens you know when you're looking at the history of uh, indian intelligence and also trying to understand the culture of indian intelligence when he travels to washington the cia here in india right they had a very strong source god knows who that source was but they had every detail about sanjeevi okay his okay. Uh, about his dietary habits his wife his his extracurricular activities everything all right but one thing they got seriously wrong was they said that sanjeevi is very close to nehru and nehru has his ears to sanjeevi which is completely wrong okay but because this kind of a, an assessment had gone to uh, washington george kennan who most people most of you must be knowing now the guy who actually spoke about the cold war and all of that he was he was he was american diplomat posted in moscow he himself wrote to washington telling that look we need this guy get out of him give him a very good reception all right but then because masanjeevi's mandate is internal intelligence he is tasked to go meet uh, j edgar hoover the famous director of fbi all right yeah, but then yeah. uh, edgar hoover doesn't really you know give him too much of importance yeah. <laughs> yeah so he says that you know it was a tour given not like you know he treated him as if he was a high school boy okay but because kenan okay. had uh, directed the uh, directed washington to take good care of him then the cia was asked to t- asked to host him it was okay. just a streak of luck that cia was asked to host him and he studied the cia at that point in time he studied the cia at that point in time he came back and he drafted a report to say this is the kind of organization we need to have for india for as an external intelligence organization because until then he had by by his own initiative what he had done was he had posted three officers to france germany and pakistan without nehru knowing he had posted them there 
but now he created a, he had drafted a blueprint but by the by the, the time uh, the moment he came back to india he there was a disaster awaiting him when he visited washington the, the ambassador of india there was nehru sister mrs vijayalakshmi pandit and because he had failed to call on her she created a huge hue and cry about it and sanjeevi was shown the door and the report was thrashed oh god okay so for 1949 a first attempt was actually made to give india an external intelligence agency right. by the initiative of the intelligence leader himself not the political leader but the intelligence leader and that was thrashed right. okay. but because of diplomatic niceties not being there this was completely thrashed was there no appeal done or something so that no, his argument of this much importance yeah his argument was that for all these operational reasons i did not have to call on the diplomat okay but you know their familial relationships and all that and by then patel yeah. was really old this is in 1950s right close to 1950s he was really old uh, so he said right. okay man uh, show him the door and uh, superseding about 30 officers a man named bn malik who was then the deputy director he was made the director of intelligence bureau now uh, unfortunately most people haven't read uh, um, malik's memoirs okay they might have read uh, the chinese betrayal and the kashmir uh, one but there's a third one which very writes about his experience as an intelligence officer so he clearly mentions there during that time if patel wasn't there our organization would not have survived right so what does this tell us at at, at the birth of this country what does it tell us one foreign intelligence is not really seen as a, as a viable profession okay in the eyes of the political leadership second you needed a strong intelligence leader to drive this intelligence machinery okay but the third and most important part is if the intelligence leader leadership is not on good terms with the political leadership then in, in, anything and everything is meaningless correct so now you compare right. what happened in the kautilyan state where it was a state driven knowledge culture to the colonial state where it was only rea- threat reactive to the post modern indian state post colonial indian state where the leadership is not even seeing foreign intelligence as as serious business right organizationally right. it survived only because of patel briefly the political the political leader in nehru is not really giving them the kind of support that they deserve so that really was the start of a certain kind of indian intelligence culture which i conclude later on when i talk about in actual when i articulate india's intelligence culture one of the main factors required uh, required mm-hmm. of people to understand india's intelligence culture is to understand the power of the indian intelligence leadership if the leader is strong the possibilities are empty but if the leader is weak okay then nothing can move up and that is why those three cases that i talk about right that right. they lead to the story right so if you want we can talk about the cases before i move to what actually india's intelligence culture looks like so sure. uh, and also what i wanted to also say is that uh, maybe today circumstantially if you, if you were to look at uh, intelligence as an institution of how it functions i think a lot of your remarks are true and it holds true naturally but at that point of time do you think the 1962 failure was the main reason why we woke up from a slumber or do you think it was just a small delay which eventually led to raw being created so what was the whole process okay um once again thank you so much for that question it is really important because you know publicly many many of us will not accept this but privately most of us will say that the chinese actually did us a lot of favor uh, you know we are sorry for those 3000 odd soldiers uh, and all that but not nothing else would have woken us up from that slumber right, right. so we always refer back to the 1950 letter that uh, sardar patel had written to nehru a warning a warning about the chinese threat after china invaded tibet but you need to understand what really changed then right from then even before that and from then on till about 1957 when we discovered the road that traveled through our aksai chin region to reach tibet Uh, so the, once that road was discovered only then did nehru realized this you know this whole bye bye thing is nonsense it's not working right but until then what happened with the indian intelligence bureau was the top leadership were all officers who were experts of uh, uh, communism international communism they were avowedly anti communist they hated the communists so they saw china through the prism of international communism and they said that this is going to be a threat to us now because nehru who did not see and krishnamanan did not see the world in this way they really did not buy that argument right so because they did not buy that argument there was no real uh, necessity for them to strengthen our intelligence bureaucracy as well right, right. because so if, 19- if you look at history of how it is written today especially about the intelligence bureau i think people are very unkind about it and i think krishnamanan himself has written a lot uh, on these 
uh, context and a lot of his successors in the Congress party even today are writing about it without taking names about them. Um, so essentially as an organization they did not fail but the leadership failed to recognize the problem for what it was because of their political bias. Partly correct. I'll tell you partly correct because this assessment that China is going to be a threat was not sufficiently recognized by the political leadership and to that extent you are correct. But when it comes to intelligence failure, there was a failure. There's indeed a failure. But I would say that the failure happened because of a prolonged neglect of the intelligence profession. Right? Because like I said, that knowledge culture was missing. Right? You did not know why you required these intelligence agencies. Suddenly, because right. Patel wrote that letter in 1950, you organized a committee known as the uh, Himmat Singh Ji Committee. It is called Border, North and Northeastern Border Committee, something of that sort. And then there they decided that now uh, strategic intelligence of all kinds, military, foreign, internal, everything has to be handed over to the Intelligence Bureau. Fine. You are asking one woman to cook everything that you want, but do you, are you going to extend other capability? That is a question that is never asked. Right? So, I know with an overextended mandate and under-resourced organization, the Intelligence Bureau got onto its business. Okay, so they very clearly knew what China was made of, what its ideological position was, and what that is going to do to uh, its relationship with India in the future. But where they went wrong was in military analysis. As much as they were experts of international communism, they knew zilch about military, military stuff. They understood nothing at all. And there is another aspect that you need to understand that is that, that is it's it's about turf wars and bureaucratic politics which again which is again why i say that you know the politicians should step up to make sure that these kind of problems are overcome so sometime right. during the 1950s malik had sent a couple of uh, his analysts to uh, there is there is a military intelligence training school in pune he had sent them there to uh, get some okay. training in military intelligence but the then uh, general of india uh, general timaya he asked him a question, like, you know, what rank are you giving these guys? Because if they are supposed to be training alongside my officers or, I, or of the rank of lieutenant and higher, what rank are you giving them? So an IPS officer himself, uh, Malik, he did not have a good answer for it because he did not want these intelligence operatives who are not, who are below the rank of the IPS to get such right. good ranks, you know, directorial ranks. So that because of that dispute, the IB analysts did not get any military training, right? So that is why uh, one uh, one IB officer who unfortunately uh, passed away, uh, you know, day before yesterday or yesterday, he was knocked off by, uh, you know, you must be knowing about this. Uh, so in Mysore. So yeah, he, in Mysore. He is, sorry. Yeah, in Mysore, I saw the video. It was it was exactly. Yeah, Aran Kulkarni, Mr. Aran Kulkarni. So he's written in his book uh, where he says that you know at that point in time we all went about collecting military intelligence like clueless jokers. You know, so a former pro personnel from the Intelligence Bureau using such terms, it really speaks a lot. So until the war, there was absolutely no idea about military knowledge within the IB. And so what they did was they fell back on something known as pattern analysis or what we call as trend analysis. What does trend analysis do? You look at the past and you observe somebody's behavior in the past and you project it onto the future. So in the past, what had happened was wherever there was Indian military presence across the, uh, around the border, right, the Chinese hadn't attacked them. Yeah. So we right. said that that is, that is what became the root of what we call as the forward policy. We said that, you know, the Chinese will not attack us because even, even where they see some bit of a presence. So it, it is, okay, it sounds like a logical proposition, but militarily it's, it's, it's really stupid. You know, you, you just can't sustain that kind of uh, presence against <clears throat> a mighty Chinese uh, army, if at all, <clears throat> sorry, right. if at all there was an invasion. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, yeah. So, yeah. um, so that's what happened, you know, so, but even while all of this is happening, you need to understand why Malik is an important character and what the intelligence bureau did even without uh, Nehru's support. There was a lot of court operations happening, American court operations to support the Tibetans at that point in time, right? So Malik had silently right. allowed the Americans to do some, some bit of it because he wanted to have, have some kind of relationship with the Americans and the British mm -hmm. and, uh, on top of it. Even before, so this is what happened was October 1962, the first invasion happens because the Chinese invaded in two waves, right? So the first invasion happened. The moment that invasion happened, Nehru gave I, uh, the Malik a blank check. You know, he said, you go do what you want, but then you have to ensure that our borders are safe in the future. So uh, General Timai had previously suggested that our border troops be uh, trained to be the first line of defense. 
Right? Yeah. Now, so on paper, if you see, there is an organization called the Special Service Bureau, which is today renamed as Sashastra Seema Bal. Right? After Kargil mm-hmm. War, it, was, it became an overt organization. But before that, it was a completely covert organization. Right? One of the strongest uh, secret intelligence organizations India has had. Right. So, on paper, you see that the organization was formed in 1963. But the volunteers were ready much before that. So, Malik had been secretly doing a lot of things. But that that talks that also says something about india's intelligence culture what is it irrespective of how good the leadership is irrespective of how good your initiatives are if there is no political support there are limitations to what you can achieve and that is why we always talk about the ik gujral's uh, doctrine as well right it is it is right. not at all true that you know india completely uh, you know pulled out all its covert action capabilities from pakistan that's 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 not the case right but the fact that there was a political directive it hampers your operation it, it itself it, it's an inbuilt obstacle right so even though malik had done quite a yeah. lot without nehru's approval right but the the kind of results it could generate was far limited and he could also do it much better than his predecessor that tells you another thing right what happened to uh, sanjeev sanjeev was thrown out because he was too much you know in your face kind of an attitude kind of thing. Okay. yeah whereas malik was different he was today when you see a lot of people write about malik they use the term psychophant all right but i my argument has yeah. always been that with nehru everybody had to be a psychophant otherwise you couldn't have survived right, right? but despite being a psychophant he always made sure that the ibs report reached the prime minister by virtue of his access right okay so that proximity has created a different thing that the prime minister did not act upon it exactly that is why to this day whenever there's been uh, an incident of surprise the prime ministers have never been able to turn around and say that the ib did not inform us about this okay? right so the ib always yeah. pushes their uh, reports and they say i have given you boss now it's up to you what you... the same thing goes with yeah. the ib also So now but as, uh, as far as intelligence accuracy is concerned uh, just a little interruption um, how do we how do we achieve intelligence accuracy because is it even achievable to its fullest is the question uh, because 1962 is sort of a uh, bookmark for everybody who needs to study the failure of intelligence the recent bookmark may be in the case of 2611 where the where the leadership actually failed to sort of act on the tips that were given off so is it even possible that we can overcome the kind of failures that we had eventually better a coordination mechanism and perhaps improve the communication between institutions of the government and if we have been able to do that especially after the failures of 1962 then why do such failures keep happening from time to time maybe they may not be as massive in nature but they they still do exist okay um see when you talk about intelligence right that's why i was uh, emphasizing on two words there is something known as informational gap and there is something known as knowledge gap right informational gaps will always remain even to even this to this day when we are living in the age of information when we talk of information overload and so on and so forth there will always be some gaps in the information that you have especially when you're living in a competitive environment right because the enemy is trying his best to ensure that uh, information is protected it's secure from you so there will always be informational gaps what shouldn't be there is knowledge gaps right what i mean by this is when you go back to the 1962 war again the 1962 war coincided with the cuban missile crisis right so when the Cuba, so india was under the assumption that you know the ib as well was under the assumption that the that the soviets sino there was there was an emerging sino soviet split okay on the one hand and sec- and on the other hand there's always a threat of taiwan attacking china with the help of the united states okay right now because of this uh, what they believed was that the the chinese that is mao's china would never make an attempt to attack india this was the assumption at that point in time now when, once the crisis broke out there the the russians had brought the chinese support okay on on a promise that they will side with the chinese if at all a war broke out with india and just before that in poland um, the chinese had spoken to the american uh, ambassador there in poland and they had promised that you know there would be no action in taiwan right these two pieces of information we did not have and we couldn't have had you know we were given given uh, the strength of our intelligence capabilities then the kind of budgets we had the kind of sources we had we couldn't have known this right so we can argue today that because of these informational gaps you went ahead with right. your, with your forward policy which which actually caused the war and so on and so forth but the argument here is knowledge gap is far beyond this if you had actually studied chinese military history you could have known how they fought in uh, korea it is the same repeat that right. happened here right 
if you had studied Chinese strategic uh, culture for what it is, right? Which to a certain extent the IB did. That's why they knew that international communism was a threat. Where whereas Nehru and uh, Menon saw the world differently, right? So these are knowledge gaps which we call as policy failures, right? Informational gaps or maybe wrong analysis of the available information and so on that can be regarded as intelligence failures. So this is the theoretical part. But for, to the, to answer the question about what you asked, right, about reforms, developing uh, different kinds of bureaucratic, uh, making bureaucratic changes, organizational changes, and so on, that is what cert- some of the scholars in the West argue that you know if you make certain good reforms, then you can always overcome intelligence failures, right? And true right. to their argument, the 1971 case actually stands in favor of their argument, right? Because yeah. we under we underwent a lot of reforms. Three organizations were formed immediately after 1962 under the DGS, that is the Special Service Bureau (SSB). Special Frontier Force (SFF) and the Aviation Research uh, Center (ARC), and in 1968 you had the RNDW itself being formed. So a lot of these organizational changes happened, and you saw what kind of a result uh, we achieved. But even there, my argument has been that 1971 is not just an intelligence success; it is also a policy success. Because Indira Gandhi is not operating under that erroneous assumption that you know the world is going to be nice to you and it's going to cause a third yeah. world war and all of that, right? So here, there was already a clear-cut notion that you know we have a certain doctrine, what today we call as the Indira Doctrine, where we said that we need to have an offensive intelligence capability yeah. because India has to be powerful in its neighborhood. Okay, so right. you started to create organizations in that manner. So when the RNDW was formed, Indira Gandhi gave only two instructions. One, I don't want it to be a police organization like the IB. It has to. You have to draw talent from the market, which is what even Kautilya said at that point in time. Which, if you read, read the chapter, you will know. Second thing she said that I will get to choose whoever becomes the leader. That is, I in the sense the prime minister will get to choose. Okay, whoever has to lead the organization. That is fine because again, like I said, if at all proximity is is what is determining the intelligence policy relationship, it's always good to have somebody within the intelligence bureaucracy who is sort of congenial with you. Okay, so these were these were the two conditions she had laid. But besides this, when you talk of reforms, what actually worked during 1971 was. There were several knowledgeable in, uh, individuals who knew how to operate the intelligence machinery regularly. So, we, one of the pet peeves about many many people who talk about India's intelligence is they say India's intelligence has no oversight, right? There's no accountability, and that's why it fails again and again and again and again. To me, that argument sounds great on on paper, but it has not been tested yet. The United States has a great accountable um, accountable you know system of accountability oversight, but they fail. British have they also fail. Okay, and yeah. we have we have performed pretty well despite no accountability and all that. I'm not I'm not making a case for uh, uh, you know not not having accountability. But what I'm trying to say yeah. here is, when trying to understand the relationship between reforms, accountability, and performance, we see that the 1971 case actually gave good performances because you had people like P. N. Huxer, D. P. Dar, R. N. Kau, and all these people who understood the business. Right. So their accountability, whatever you see that for the first time just before the 1970 war. There is a dialogue happening between all these characters where they say that you know why is the IB director being paid so much? He was getting a salary of three thousand five hundred then, uh, so why is he get, alone getting so much money? Whereas uh, the raw chief, the CBI uh, director, and all these people who are doing somewhat a uh, similar job, why are they not getting so much? Right? So they say that you see the morale of the organizations are increasing because now the pay is also increasing, and also they say that you know because these organizations are somewhat doing a similar job. There is duplication happening, so we need to work around that problem. So you see, you have these kind of people who are actually invested in the process. They are invested in the business. They understand intelligence for what it is. Otherwise, what happens? You know, just because you say parliamentary accountability and you have a bunch of politicians who and who, who who understand nothing. I mean, some of them do. There are some very knowledgeable people, but in most cases they don't. So that kind of an accountability is again not. It it does not translate into uh, good performances. So that's that's that. That's I think thing. that's the thing about failure, right? It's like a cricket match. Like once India fails in a cricket match, like you can attribute the failure to anything at all. But once it's successful, you will really identify the elements for what they are, and then you start to praise them. Correct. Nineteen seventy one was some sort of a landmark moment that way. No, but yeah, you're right in a way. Uh, but but then where my disagreement is, and that is also proven by the past, is that, yeah. you know, failure really humbles you. You ask yourself, why did I fail? success right. gets to your mind you don't really ask why you succeeded but do you think that was realized at an institutional level it was you know that that is why even uh, let be raman writes that you know when uh, the army praised the army w after the 71 war she was the only one who had her feet on the ground and said that you know uh, don't let this get to your head because those guys are appreciating you because you won the war now 
if at all they had lost right. it yeah and you see that in the 1980s immediately in the 1980s right um, after the emergency i mean after the emergency morali desai period is there and that is very bad for uh, the army of you uh, i can talk at length about that about what uh, morali desai charan singh and all these people did um, so but the point is that post once indira gandhi came back in 1980s from then on um, you know and and later on when rajiv gandhi came to power we really got a little bit aggressive um, you know of the kind that we hadn't seen before for example if you look at the period between 87 and 80, 86 87 88 you see that the yeah. indian army is active everywhere you have operation Bra- uh, brass tax happening with uh, pakistan against pakistan operation checkerboard yeah. against china you know the northeast insurgencies are growing at the same time you have the khalistani movement also picking up and we have committed troops in sri lanka so you see we are just spread, we are spread everywhere yeah. you know the, the kind of thing that you've never seen in the past and i don't know if you'll ever see in the future but right. uh, you see at that point in time what happened is that you see the, the indian army they bungled up in operation blue star right and they bungled up in sri lanka and all these places but their argument has always been that there was intelligence failure but then when you actually go back and see how they made their decisions intelligence was not co- actually consulted you know when it comes to sri lanka they believe that these are you know petty guys we can tackle them right so when things went haywire they made intelligence a scapegoat but it is never part right. of a planning right so that is exactly so what is perhaps that actually. overestimation of operational capabilities that exactly exactly that is why uh, in my book right there are two uh, main theories that i have sort of debunked when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to indian intelligence right the two main theories that i am talking about is that one is there is something known as khan's law k h n you know khan was uh, he was he was an intelligence scholar who studied the uh, who studied hitler's intelligence and all that according to khan's law what he says is that intelligence is always a prerogative of the defensive whereas counter intelligence is a prerogative of the offensive that as in if you are going on an offensive you don't really need information you just need to protect your plans right your your right. operational plans from the enemy whereas if you are a defensive power you always need to have a lookout for inter- you need very strong intelligence capabilities because your entire right. security strategy is premised on advanced information okay if, if, if you you say you don't want to attack pakistan but pakistan might want to attack you so you need intelligence about that but when you look at india despite being a defensive nation we go counter to the khan's law we have always operated on the best case scenario not on the worst case scenario right, right. so i we always think that you know pakistan cannot attack will not attack at this point in time so you went in uh, with, with china let's start with china you said uh, panchil and all that because you never you didn't even consult the ip when you went to sign the panchil agreement and in 99 you went on the bus diplomacy again without con- consulting our intelligence agencies in sri lanka you landed troops where he said that will you there was some set of bra- bravado when he said that will come back in 48 hours or 24 hours how did you come to that conclusion that you'll come back in 28 hours or 48 hours right so for a lot of this we uh, we tend to be a defensive nation but at the same time we don't give that kind of respect we need for intelligence and that is why my argument is as a defensive power you need a very strong offensive intelligence capability and after that uh, the importance given to counter intelligence perhaps after some of the initial successes that we had do you give us an idea of how perhaps decolonized our institutions are as of today and what has happened especially after the late 1980s because that was some sort of a breaking point like you said and there was a lot of uh, pressure on the military on the intelligence to perform beyond their capabilities perhaps at that point in time but obviously 20 25 years from there india is um, much more different now economically as a power and even strategically as Uh, how we are performing in many of our borders and in terms of resolving a lot of the disputes that we have so how has it evolved since then and what can we conclude since the uh, if we were to perhaps reflect back on the last two decades honestly i would like to reserve my comments as far as it comes to the modern times and that's precisely why i ended the book with uh, you know with the end of the 20th century and i right. deliberately kept 21st century out of it for want of yes one you don't have high quality information on which you can base your analysis Yeah. and second thing is that there are a lot of things which even i might not be comfortable talking about uh, and you know putting it on paper so precise that's precisely why i stopped with the 99 war so since you spoke about the 1980s some of the kind of changes that happened and all that so the entire kautilyan character that we are talking about right that is present only during the 1970s not before that not after that right, right. after that even during the early 90s you had um, from narsimha rao you had a lot of other prime ministers come in between right there were a lot yeah. of changes that happened until uh, vajpayee came and they all had very different ideas about intelligence so 
that is when when i speak about uh, i think this is a good segment for me to get into and talk about um, india's intelligence culture as i have built it in the book so deriving from india's strategic culture i make the argument that india's intelligence culture is determined by five factors and these five factors are not independent of each other they are highly intertwined right the first is that of uh, the strength of india's intelligence leadership which i have been talking about all this while second is that of um, the strength of india's intelligence organization itself right so india india's organizational strength is derived from its from the strength of the intelligence leadership that's why i say they're interconnected and the third is the strength of india's covert action now covert action is a part that i haven't gone too deeply in in, in this book because that is a subject unto itself but generally when we say covert action is uh, because when you talk about intelligence strategic intelligence right, it is mostly advisory what does this knowledge say what are you advising right so the, it is mostly advisory but covert action is executionary it it is you're getting in, you're moving from the realm of intelligence to policy so many of the secret yeah. agencies are also tasked with uh, executing certain policies so that covert action capability was really sharp during 1971 post 1971 it it uh, declined drastically and i've also given some of the reasons why in the book what has happened high rates of corruption and so on and so forth and then the right. fourth uh, point which is a very important point is the strength of consumer literacy so when you talk of the consumers of intelligence right they are the military consumers diplomatic consumers and the political consumers here paradoxically when you talk about um, political consumers one thing that we have observed is that uh, what i could observe in the book is that the higher the rate of general literacy right the lower the rate of intelligence literacy is okay nehru saw himself as a great intellectual so he did not really see any purpose for intelligence same thing yeah. you see in the, in the 1990s narasimha rao comes right narasimha rao is i mean i want so to not really talk about his intellectual capabilities so he did yeah. use ib to a certain extent for whatever purposes um, but as far as foreign intelligence was concerned right he always thought that he knew better you, you know his diplomatic skills were better and all that and right, the same right. goes with ik gujral later uh, again yeah. an intelligent man who thought that you know he knew better than the, the organizations so you yeah. see you know, i've heard people, a lot of people say that uh, even when it comes to nuclear i mean uh, that was the time when a lot of the nuclear discussion discussions were also happening interesting a lot of uh, interestingly a lot of the approvals also came during the devegowda era correct correct so, correct <laughs> yeah yeah that's true that's true so so you see when that intelligence literacy is very high right uh, sorry sorry uh, general literacy is very high right their tendency to accept intelligence is very limited but whereas others who have sort of somewhat even though they are not saying they were less intellectual of course rajiv gandhi was educated indira gandhi was also educated but their yeah. their experience with 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 the real world you know uh, indira gandhi's ability to learn from the mistakes of a, of a father and Correct. so on and so forth it had created a certain kind of characteristic uh, characteristic change in them that made them more rajiv gandhi is, is another kind of case okay because i've always heard that he was he was he was a young guy so he was quite aggressive and all that and he liked the spooky side of intelligence mm-hmm. and all of that so and that's why he and also his penchant for technology was something that is that keeps getting repeated whenever i interview uh, right. intelligence officers so uh, so we see that you know these kind of people who who are not too high on their own intellectualism they tend to be more humble and they and they accept intelligence in certain manner but even there like, you know vajpay was quite humble because vajpay advani and all these people initially they were uh, critics of the rnw because they were part of the moraji government then but slowly they learned what are uh, what the, what this organization actually does but even there what happens is political calculations right You, the kind of euphoria that fo- followed after the bus diplomacy after the prime minister went on the bus and all of that so you you have a, you you tend to not pay heed to intelligence at that point in time where you see the cost benefit analysis of not listening to it is somewhat high so that is the political consumer and even the diplomatic consumers sometimes because they are also trained you know at least till the year 2000 they were trained in the nehruvian way of thinking so when you go back to 1971 you see that uh, the rnw was really enthusiastic about breaking pakistan and creating bangladesh whereas uh, the indian diplomatic yeah. corps was always arguing that you know we should not interfere in one's in another country's business internal affairs and all that right. whole uh, punchy yeah. thing right so they are trained in that they were trained in that kind of uh, thing uh, that is something we at least see till the year 2000 uh, i think uh, there is a beautiful book written on india's diplomatic history um, i'll tell you the name like once i read correct so uh, sure. he also that uh, comes goes beyond ethnocentrism and sees how, and he observes the author observes uh, how i think it is deep ke datare yeah that's uh, that's his name i believe so um, so you have all these kind of consumers you have their literacy rate right so the fourth i spoke about intelligence leadership the strength of the organization strength of court action strength of the uh, intelligence literacy of these three, these uh, the consumers 
and the last consumer is the military consumer that's an important uh, actor we shouldn't leave out you know because like i said they yeah. have failed in terms of understanding what exactly intelligence is uh, through my interviews i've observed that they they feel that intelligence is something that has to lay it lay it out in black and white about what's going to happen uh they don't really right. understand the limitations and so on so there is a lot to talk about that not to go too deep into it but i believe that there is mm-hmm. room for greater dialogue to emerge between these two organizations and finally the last point is the strength of india's international relations itself because one of the key sources of information like i said you know there are always information gaps the only way you can get information is also through international partnerships international uh, liaison agree- agreements right they have evolved it has always been a mixed bag right so because india one thing you need to understand about india and this and it is very very pertinent at this point in time when there is so much of political turbulence happening in india the whole reputation of yeah. uh, india as a state uh, is is being you know uh, uh, it is being played with in uh, internationally and so on we need to understand that india is a civilizational state whether you agree with that term or not it is what it, what it is and it is recognized as such you know you, you wouldn't believe that until about 1970s or so uh um, many in portugal and all those countries our diplomats were considered hindus not not indians you know because india was recognized as a hindu state or whatever right so right. this this is not a case for case for india to declare itself a hindu state or whatever i'm telling you hard facts about how the world views you right yeah, i mean, I mean we were the ones to push pluralism uh, exactly. in their throats from time right. to time so you know we've rebranded that idea of india essentially yeah so the, the point that i was trying to make here is you are not going to find natural friends anywhere right pakistan will always have friends in the islamic world right uh, by virtue of uh, your um, enmity with the islamic state of pakistan you might have friends with israel but again they are also a jewish state they're not going to be your friends eternally as long as it serves their purpose they will be your friends and that's also something that i've written in the book because until 1992 when their embassy was formed their level of cooperation with india as far as intelligence is concerned was very high but once the embassy got established they didn't really have any real need for them to cooperate with us to the same level that they were cooperating right. previously until again terrorism became a problem in the late 90s and early 2000s right see so it's always right. a question of why somebody is being your friend i always keep getting asked this question will india ever be part of the five eyes countries my clear answer is no those are white anglo saxon protestant countries do you hear the word hindu anywhere there if you don't then you're not going to be a part of it right so don't never have yeah. such kind of dreams so for us that's that's that tells you something very serious about uh, international intelligence cooperation right they will give you information only so long as they feel that it is necessary to be shared with india for in order to fulfill their own national interests united states uh, britain and all that to some degree yes we had very good support from the soviet union during the 70s they gave us a dedicated satellite and all that so they were more uh, altruistic when it came to that for their own reasons but the point about uh, yeah. international cooperation is that it it always has limited utility and sometimes the the cost of the relationship far outweighs the benefits especially for a country like india so when you look at all these five uh, factors together right uh, the leadership strength organization covert action uh, uh, consumer literacy and international relations that gives you a certain kind of indian intelligence culture it gives you a story of india's intelligence in a manner that is very distinct from other countries okay so now you have to ask your question ask yourself this question whenever there's a failure what is our immediate uh, reaction we go to the Br- british we go to the americans study their organizations come back and we ape them here right when the cause of your failure is different how will that medicine work for you right and that's exactly why i said that you have to understand india's intelligence culture and strategic surprises right that's the title of the book and that is what is the story of spying for south law So uh, thank yeah. you so much for this. Oh my god it's it's amazing. It takes me back to the classes that we used to have uh, back in Manipal. Uh so which is why I held myself back today and I let the platform be completely occupied by you. Thank you so much because this is right up my alley and these are my areas of interest as well. So I consider myself a student here when I'm talking to you and less of an interviewer. Dr. Dheeraj it's always a pleasure and an honor to have you here on our platform and i hope we can have such conversations in the future as well thank you sir thank you so much for the opportunity thank you so much and viewers please do let us know what you thought about this uh, if you have any questions uh, based on what you heard during the presentation uh, or the interview please do let us know in the comment section below and dr dheeraj will be happy to answer them uh, on a separate occasion thank you so much for tuning in and until next time this is your host sharan sir thank you